I'm Mark Steiner, great to have you all with us on this day. The COVID-19 pandemic has much of the world gripped in fear. Entire countries are on lockdown. People are fearful, and rightfully so, of being in contact with each other. For us here, empty shelves and supermarkets, no cars on the highways, empty streets, give you that eerily post-apocalyptic feel. Donald Trump labeling this as the Chinese virus and urging us to go back to normalcy seems unattached to reality. It's not the Chinese flu. It's not the other, it's us. More accurately, it's our destruction of natural habitats and the climate crisis that is unleashing these viruses among us. COVID-19 was being blamed on the poor, peaceful pangolin. But this poor anteater that looks like an armadillo may be part of the reason the virus spread in China, but it's our industrial development that's destroying his habitat that brought them into contact with us, and then some thought it would be a good idea to eat these things. So it's not bats or pangolins, but what our human expansion has done to unleash viruses from Ebola to COVID-19. From the destruction of wild habitats to melting our permafrost and Arctic shelves, viruses we've never known existed may be coming our way. And we're joined by Dr. Sonia Shah. She wrote the book, Pandemic, Tracking Contagions from Cholera to Ebola and Beyond. Her newest book is The Next Great Migration, The Beauty and Terror of Life on the Move that comes out in June. And her latest article published in The Nation is, Think Exotic Animals Are to Blame for the Coronavirus? Think again, and it's being widely read. So welcome, Sonia Shah, good to have you with us. Nice to be here. And help us think again. <laughs> so <laughs> the connection between habitat loss and climate crisis can get lost in this conversation when we try to figure out how to avoid these things now and in the future. Talk a bit about that connection. This latest coronavirus is just the last in a series. Well, it won't be the last, but it's just the latest in a series of newly emerged pathogens. So over the past like 50, 60 years or so, we've had over 300 of these pathogens kind of newly emerge um, or re-emerge into places where they'd never been seen before. So um, that includes uh, Ebola in West Africa in 2014. It had never been seen in that part of the continent before. Um, it includes Zika in the Americas, where it had never been seen before. We have new kinds of tick-borne illnesses, new kinds of mosquito-borne illnesses, new kinds of antibiotic-resistant um, bacterial pathogens, um, and, and the list goes on and on, including, of course, this, this latest uh, coronavirus. Um, and the, about 60% of these new pathogens come from the same place, and that is the bodies of animals. About 70% of them come from the bodies of wild animals. So what I tried to do in my work is look at how does a microbe that is you know, generally harmless in its native habitat, in its natural habitat, turn into a pandemic causing pathogens? What are the changes that have to, have to happen for that process to occur? And what I found is that in a lot of cases, it's because humans are invading wildlife habitat. So when we cut down the trees where bats roost, you know, if, if bats are roosting in some far off jungle, we cut down those trees. Well, they don't just go away. They come and fly into our gardens and backyards and farms instead. Um, so in all these ways, when we destroy wildlife habitat, we force wildlife to come into closer contact to where we live, you know, into little fragments of habitat that we have left for them. And that eases all kinds of new kinds of contact between animals and humans. It increases hunting, trading, and even casual contact. For example, if you touched uh, you know, a, a piece of fruit that had some bat saliva on it, you could get Ebola virus on your hands and you put that your hand in your mouth and that's it. The microbe that lives in the animal's bodies has come into the human body. And that's how the Ebola outbreak of 2014 actually started. Um, and we'll probably eventually be able to trace back this current pandemic to some kind of single spill, quote unquote, spillover um, event like that. But it's, it's the root of it is animals, microbes and animals coming into human bodies because we're destroying their habitat and bringing them closer into contact with ours. A couple of things here I got to explore, I mean, which you mentioned a moment ago. I mean, we're talking about viruses, everything from Ebola to uh, HIV to, to, to Lyme disease in this country are all kind of erupting for the similar reason. And when you look at some of the new science coming out about the potential viruses being unleashed by the uh, melting of permafrost and the Arctic ice shelves, you add that to the habitat issue, we unfortunately and frighteningly could just be be seeing the beginning of what could erupt over the next decades. And I, do you think that's alarmist? Do you think that's real? 
I don't know that the melting permafrost is sort of the biggest driver of this. I think invading wildlife habit is a bigger driver because you also have to think about um, which microbes in animals' bodies can easily adapt to human bodies. Um, and so that's usually uh, microbes that live in other mammals, and it's usually um, ones that are more similar to us. So, you know, we get a lot of um, pathogens from pigs, for example. Um, we'll get fewer from, like, reptiles, right? So, um, so the source matters because each microbe has to kind of adapt, you know. So this is, this is a long process. This doesn't happen instantly. Um, what happens is there's repeated contact between humans and the animal reservoir of these microbes. And those repeated contacts allow the microbe to slowly adapt to the human body, right? Because in the beginning, it's an animal microbe. It's not going to make you sick necessarily, or your immune system is going to get rid of it. The pathogen has to adapt. So there has to be repeated contact over time. Um, so we've seen these wet markets have existed, for example, um, which is a source of the SARS pathogen that came out in 20 in 2002 2003 um, and maybe the source the origins of the current coronavirus hmm. those wet markets existed for many many years but what happened over the past 20 or 30 years is they started to get bigger and bigger because the Chinese economy expanded and people were going farther and farther into wildlife habitat to invade, you know, places that are farther and farther away, bring animals from lots of different places closer together. So it's that process, of, slow process of expansion and the repeated contact between humans and wildlife that allows these microbes to adapt and become human pathogens. In a, in a broader question here, if human expansion and capitalist development and all kinds of industrial development and development period are part of the, of the causes that, that underlies this, um, um, the, this, these growth of viruses, then how do we think about what to do about that? I mean, there's one thing to talk about how you fight COVID-19 at this moment. And I think that's, that's one issue. The other issue is how do you prevent the COVID-19s of the future from erupting, given the nature of human human beings to expand. I mean, you wrote in your article that even when you think of the Neolithic period <laughs> that, that, the, that was unleashed there, tuberculosis and, and measles uh, that are still with us. So, so how do we begin to talk as a society, as human beings, as, as a culture, how to change what we do in order not to have these explosions? Or is that, is that even possible? It is possible. We're always going to have infectious diseases, right? I mean, we live on a microbial planet, and that's sort of part of the human condition. So we don't want to sanitize the planet of microbes or anything like that. So the trick is, do you have to have uh, pandemics, though? And, and I think my, from my research and reporting, the answer is absolutely not. Pandemics are manufactured by human activities. We'll have infectious disease outbreaks, but we don't have to have these massive pandemics that travel across the globe and you know result in in what we're seeing today. Um, and one step towards that is, of course, reducing our our destruction of wildlife habitat so that. Um, microbes that live in animals' bodies stay in their, an in their bodies. Reducing the impact of climate change will help too because of course we know that a lot of species are moving into new places to escape the effects of, cli of the climate crisis. Um, and as they do that, they're moving into new kinds of contact with human populations also. So that provides other opportunities for these spillovers to happen. But we also can sort of actively surveil where these spillovers are happening and kind of contain them at their source. You know, we don't know which microbe will cause the next pandemic, but we do know what the drivers are. Um, we know that it's things like invasion of wildlife habitat, lots of flight connections, lots of slums, lots of factory farms. These are all drivers of um, uh, pandemic causing pathogens. So since we know that, we can predict where it's most likely to happen. So scientists have actually come up with these global um, hotspot maps. There are places, you know, it's a map and it just shows like where are all the places in the world where it's most likely that a pandemic path causing pathogen could emerge. And in those places, we can do active surveillance, really look at all the microbes there. Don't wait for the outbreak to happen. Don't wait for cases to emerge so people are already getting sick and the microbes are already spreading exponentially, but actually look for them sort of preventively, you know, to do that kind of active surveillance. And that was actually a project that was going on for about 10 years until the Trump administration killed it last year. You're talking about you're, you're talking about predict and the stuff that CDC was doing that was their budget was canceled. That that's the that's what you're talking about. Talking about right. that. So that was a program funded by USAID, um, and it involved a lots lots of different agencies and academic institutions around the world. Um, and what they would do is they would go to these disease hotspots 
and try to actively surveil how microbes might be changing. So they would sample, say, you know, scat from animals or take blood from farmers or hunters. You know, they had a variety of different ways to actually actively look for these microbes and then see how they might be changing. And they actually were able to find about 900, I think, um, over the course of that 10 year period. And so then you can, you know, say, okay, well, this microbe looks like it's evolving to adapt to the human body in a way that could make it, you know, into a, a, a dangerous pathogen. Let's change our behaviors on this local level so that it doesn't have those opportunities anymore. You know, maybe it's changing, you know, hunting practices or some trading practices or something much more localized that you could alter through, you know, a small intervention as opposed to waiting until it starts, you know, erupting in epidemics and spreads around the world and then th thinking, oh, okay, now, now let's try to, now let's try to contain it. So without being um, accusatory here, just a larger question as we close, do we, if PREDICT had been funded fully, if we had full funding to, to be able to look ahead and see what potential pathogens may arise, could this have been avoided? Is that possible? Or is that too much conjecture? I mean, it's possible. This is all probabilities, right? So say there's thousands of microbes out there that, be, that could become the next pandemic causing pathogen. If we could surveil and contain, you know, 80% of those, would our risk of pandemics go down? Yes, it would. Does it mean that this particular virus would right. not have emerged? Well, you know, who knows? As we conclude, Sonia, give us a little tip for the future about where you what we should be wrestling with as a society in terms of how we go forward. The first thing is we got to get this thing under control. And, um, you know, the, 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 what's happening now is, um, you know, commercial pressures and political pressures are altering our containment strategy. And what we're going to see is a bloodbath in our hospitals. So all of us need to chip in. And I think one of the things that's really um, striking about these uh, these outbreaks of novel kinds of diseases is that there is no drug, there is no vaccine, there is no easy medical biomedical product that we can all use to solve it, right? Because they come up too fast. And, and you know, by the time you get the vaccine or the drug, you've already had this whole wave of epidemic. So what that means is that the only thing that really works is collective action and solidarity. And I think we're starting to see that in different parts of the world and people are trying and that's really gonna be the solution out of this thing. Well, Sonia Shah, A, thank you for the work you do and the writing you do. It's really important. And I look forward to seeing what else you produce. Look forward to your book coming out in June. And I wanna thank you so much for joining us here on The Real News today. I appreciate you taking the time with us. I know you're very busy at this moment. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm Mark Stoudy here for The Real News Network. Thank you all for joining us. Let us know what you think. We'll be covering this pandemic intensely from all different quarters. So take care and take care of yourself.